Hi. So we started talking um, about startups again and supporting them and how the industry works with small companies. I had the pleasure of meeting Layla Partridge just uh, this fall and got to know more about a program she's running. And this is Stanley and Techstars working together also in this area of industrial internet of things, but she's a real thought leader in this area. And I thought she would help us talk about what the opportunities are today and how partnerships can help us really think more of a systems approach to advancing these fields. So Layla is gonna introduce a panel for us today of startups from right here at the Research Park that are examples of this type of work. Layla. Great, I actually pronounce it Lila. So uh, Lila Partridge, no worries. It, it always ends up that way. So my pleasure. My in being here name today. Is Lila, I should know better, just spelled differently. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it goes wrong and I don't, I don't worry about it at all. But I am distinctly, um, it's my distinct pleasure to, um, let me talk a little bit about myself and then I will turn it over to each of the other folks here, the entrepreneurs to introduce themselves. Uh, Lila Partridge, and I'm the Managing Director for the Techstars Stanley Black & Decker Accelerator. It focuses on AI advanced manufacturing. Uh, Techstars, for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, is an early, early stage global company. Uh, we run uh, ideation on early stage weekends and weeks uh, for entrepreneurs. Um, in about 1,300 countries, uh, cities worldwide, and then in 22 countries worldwide, we run accelerators, and those are formal programs that run 13 weeks long. We have city-based ones in Tokyo and uh, London and New York and Boston and Seattle, and then about 30 of our uh, 46 uh, accelerators are corporate uh, partnerships, and they might be what uh, I have with Stanley, where we focus on manufacturing, or it might be a group of a consortium of 10 companies. Uh, we have a music uh, consortium in Hollywood that has some of the biggest competitors moving together in that space as well. Um, my background, I was at Intel Capital during the formative years and an entrepreneur for 10 years after that and um, now joining Techstars. So that's my background. And the topic that we're gonna talk about today is, is how startups work with corporate partnerships. And I have with me, uh, for uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm going to kind of go from right to left over here and let them introduce themselves and, and spend about five minutes talking about their company, and uh, then we can dive into the discussion. Jinmei, you're up. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Lila, and uh, thanks, Laura, for inviting us, as well as the rest of the Enterprise Works community. Uh, so I'm Jinmei Soman. I'm the co-founder and CEO at EarthSense. Uh, let me pull up maybe a video uh, to while I talk about what we do. Um, but at EarthSense, uh, we are a robotics and AI uh, startup uh, focusing, primarily, focusing primarily on agriculture right now. Uh, and in that context, we have been working with some of the largest uh, agricultural startup, uh, agriculture enterprise uh, companies in the world. Uh, so this is our robot, TerraSentia. Uh, it's developed specifically to collect very large amounts of data uh, and very large amounts of unique data from these high value uh, product development fields uh, in agriculture. And this is in a, you know, uh, at a glance, this is basically what we do. Uh, so the robots uh, that we've developed travel autonomously through uh, essentially what's uh, tens of millions of plots every year kind of work, um, pump out uh, terabytes of data every day uh, from simple sensors, uh, sort of a proprietary combination of simple sensors, including RGB, LiDAR, GPS, you know, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, we fuse all of that data and then analyze it in order to tell these, uh, help these large enterprise customers uh, improve their products faster and cheaper. Uh, so these are, you know, companies that are making the better varieties of corn or soybean or cotton, and that's their sort of day in, day out, right? They need to keep improving their seeds uh, in order for farmers to choose their seeds over their competitors. And of course, you know, they need to keep improving their seeds in order for the seeds to be more efficient, more productive, more resilient to climate change related shocks, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, 
what we found out when we initially started with this was that you know we would have rather done just the AI side of things. Uh, but what we found out was that most of the critical data in this world uh, didn't actually exist. Like people were still walking these millions of plots, uh, you know, and taking notes, not quite pen and paper, maybe they had some tablets, but they were still making measurements by hand. Uh, so we ended up developing this hardware platform uh, basically from scratch. And now, um, you know, as of this year, we've deployed, uh, or in 2020, we've deployed over 45 of these robots uh, in a variety of crops uh, all around the world. And so far this year, we have about 20 terabytes of data from you know, teams of these robots going out and collecting lots and lots of data. And now we're turning it through and as a result, you know, paying Jeff Bezos even more money than he currently has. Uh, so that, that's kind of the state of the art on our side. Um, and really we've only kind of started scratching the surface. So the interactions that we have with these enterprise customers have so far been sort of pilots that have been gradually scaling up. Uh, with one of our major corporate customers, we scan maybe 1% of their fields in the US, 1% of their corn fields in the US uh, this year, a uh, few times. Uh, and that generated about eight terabytes of data. So before too long, we'll be generating sort of terabytes of data on a weekly basis. Uh, and then, you know, we get into all kinds of, uh, issues about, you know, how do we analyze this data? How do we track it? You know, where do we analyze it? How does that data get from point A to point B? So all kinds of amazing, uh, you know, big data problems that we are creating for ourselves. Uh, but that's what's needed because ultimately what the customers want is a quick overview of their fields. And of course, this is just the GUI, but we also integrate it into their downstream analytics pipeline. Um, but you know, this is the kinds of data that they want off from a field of the hundreds of plots. How did the different varieties do, and which ones do we take to the next uh, stage of product development? Which ones do we commercialize, etc. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we've been doing. We're starting to integrate our data systems with our customers' data systems. So you know, figuring out you know uh, how we get access to their. Azure or AWS infrastructure, um, how do we, you know, which parts belong where, who has access to what data, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so that's kind of uh, our perspective. We're creating massive sets of data and then analyzing it and sort of fundamentally changing the agriculture industry from the ground up uh, based on the new data set that we've created. Thanks. Great, thank you. Daphne. Great. Hi, um, I'm Daphne Pruce, and I'm going to tell you about Aspiring Universe. Let me get a couple of slides up here. Uh, so very similar theme to what you heard before, but we're coming at it from the opposite direction, using satellite data and airborne data, other remote data streams to understand how crops are growing and improve resource management for farmers and larger entities as well in the agriculture supply chain. So we um, use science-based modeling and then that has been verified over time by uh, ground truth data. And it's a complete package or complete analysis of land, water and carbon resources. So the, the company is uh, founded based on technology coming out of the University of Illinois. Uh, it's been operating for less than a year, but it's leveraging uh, almost a decade of research that primarily came out of Caillou Guan's lab. He's the founder. There are also a couple of other uh, University of Illinois professors that have um, been co-founders. And we've really benefited from the resources at the university, not only the uh, PhD and other students in, in the labs, um, but also uh, the facility at Blue Waters who has provided us an ability to, to crunch massive quantities of data. So that has been licensed, as I said, to the company. And overall, what the company has today is um, the ability to fuse many data streams 
different kinds of satellite data, weather data, soil composition data, um, integrate all of that uh, coming from various places, as I said. And we've done that over the past 20 years. So for every plot of land in the entire world, we have a 20 year historical profile. We can correlate crop yields to weather or other kinds of uh, factors that are happening. And also can infer below ground dynamics like nutrient use, nitrogen use, so this is, uh, this is really innovative. Uh, there's no one else that has this kind of comprehensive package in the industry. Um, because of that innovation and also that um, Dr. Guan's work is fairly well known in, in, the, in the community, we've had a number of uh, corporate partners come to us and ask us for customized R&D. So this has really been the first path of funding in the company. And in fact, um, right now it's providing sufficient capital for early financing. So the company has not had to seek venture financing at this time. The kinds of projects that uh, large companies are interested in, they're, they're trying to get their arms around farm productivity and management practices, comparing one bit of ground to another. I think many of you know, um, there are millions and millions of farmers in the world, about 550 million independent farms and meeting the food and production needs of the planet is, is very complex and doing that sustainably uh, requires that you have a lot of data. So some of these projects also are interested in um, over a region, how much water is consumed. That's, that's something we can measure. Uh, how can we improve sustainability? Um, for people looking forward, they're interested in crop yield projections, insurance firms in particular, and also compliance of, of their customers. So this time of working with the large companies has allowed us to have a really good customer discovery program as well. We understand what their needs are. We're learning to frame our output in ways that are digestible for them. And then that's also allowing us time to develop more standardized products that we're making available by subscription. And so we're going to ultimately be transitioning to more of a recurrent standardized package, but these collaborations have been incredibly helpful in kicking, kicking uh, that off the ground and giving us time to, to do the work needed. A couple of our early products are, are assessing farmland performance for people who are buying and selling agricultural land and also forecasting crop yields for everyone from commodity managers to supply chain managers. So thank you for uh, the time and the invitation again, um, and look forward to discussing this further. Exactly. Sam, you're up. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about, uh, you know, what we've been doing. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Black Foundry. Um, I think I pulled up the slides. I don't know if you guys can see it, mm -hmm. but yep. um, uh, so yeah, so I uh, we uh, did our PhD at the University of Illinois in the Institute for Genomic Biology, and uh, you know we developed this fully automated robotic platform uh, back uh, in 2015, I believe. Uh, so we uh, uh, got some interest from corporations that, that they wanted to use this machine to do uh, some of their R and D and. Uh, um, you know, automate uh, some of the projects and, uh, you know, accelerate some of the research that they were doing. And uh, after, you know, one or two requests, we, you know, realized this may be a very viable uh, business opportunity. So uh, a few years ago, we started a Life Foundry to uh, pursue uh, the, this, uh, this opportunity. And uh, initially, we started working mostly with uh, corporations, but uh, uh, later, we uh, most we uh, are uh, you know developing our own, own products. Uh, so just uh, very briefly about uh, what we do at Life Foundry, uh, we you know we, uh, biology is very complicated as we all know, and you know we have very uh, um, um, and we believe to our core that you know any sufficiently complicated system that is easier to be you know tested than understood can be treated as a black box so instead of understanding how this you know complex web of metabolic uh, networks and regulations work we make different changes to the input to the system and then we look at the output and that's how we 
uh, do the optimization. So um, uh, we have been able to, uh, uh, by reducing the sampling costs and uh, the increasing the data quality in biological systems, we've been able to engineer and optimize biological systems without understanding uh, the why in a lot of cases. So we make different changes to the microbes and then we see the output. And the area we are, and the, the the tool we are using that is you know our fully automated robotic platform. So we have a central uh, cart uh, in the uh, in the company, and uh, there is an arm mounted on it. And then this this uh, arm and cart system will move around the lab, move the samples between the different stations, and uh, we can we run very complicated workflows. Um, and this obviously is just the hardware piece, and the software is uh, equally or maybe even sometimes more difficult uh, to uh, to do and uh, we, you know we can run multiple workflows at the time and uh, uh, perform multiple projects and schedule the different uh, projects with different uh, conflicts with each other um, so the the area we are mostly working on is the uh, fermentation chemicals uh, so producing food and uh, beverages um, you know cosmetics and uh, uh, some uh, food supplements and uh, we uh, uh, we've been working initially we started working with bigger corporations but um, you know that it takes a lot of time uh, to uh, to get a contract through a big company I'm sure we'll be talking about this and uh, uh, we uh, now started developing our own microbes to produce these chemicals and uh, you know then we can sell that uh, to uh, uh, to these companies um, so uh, you know an, an example of the projects we've done is that um, because we can automate and reduce the sampling costs a lot we did an exhaustive search software system of thousands of different combinations we just did assemble and uh, manufacture all the different prototypes and all the different inputs possible inputs and found the, the maximum um, and the, the best the system and uh, it was done in just a few days and we have been able to use machine learning also to to improve the production of uh, those chemicals so in here for example we have we have the system with uh, thousands tens of thousands of different uh, possibilities and using uh, machine learning and the Bayesian optimization algorithm we were able to uh, explore initially and then find the areas of more interest and uh, found the optimum to be uh, in that uh, area and uh, uh, you know, we we, sh we did uh, compare to the conventional sampling and with uh, the very few sampling, uh, very few experiments and costs, uh, we can uh, increase the the, uh, the productivity of those microbes even further. So, so um, yeah, that's that's what we've been doing uh, for the uh, for the past few years, and uh, we are very excited to reduce the cost even further. And uh, with machine learning, we will be able to do even uh, uh, less experiments and uh, gain more uh, insights from, from those experiments. Thanks, Sam. Manny, you are last but not least. Go for it. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me today. My name is uh, Mani Gopavar. I am Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Reconstruct. Uh, Reconstruct is a SaaS platform for the construction industry uh, by construction, I'm referring to the entire spectrum of design, construction, how you're operating buildings and infrastructure systems. What we offer is a platform uh, for visual monitoring of working place on construction sites. So without really being on site, you can tap into your existing images and videos that maybe you're taking with cell phone devices, maybe you're taking with drones over the job site or 360 degree action cameras and we transform them into actionable insight in terms of how much work has been done on the project. Um, the core technology behind Reconstruct is a number of IP technology we created at the University of Illinois. So at the University of Illinois, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Computer Science and Technology Entrepreneurship. And this was a uh, project we were working on uh, from a team of two. We've grown the company to a team of 45 full-time people across three different offices. And now the technology, especially with COVID, has been used across hundreds of projects around the globe. So we have projects in four continents, close to about 1,000 projects. And we work on many kinds of projects, from small building projects to campus projects with Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, all the way to infrastructure projects in Japan. 
I want to just show you one simple picture so you can actually see uh, the very basic concept behind our system. All there is to it is really tapping into your images and design information so we can visualize what is there versus what should be there in the context of the same image. We do this completely automatically. And then we find the delta between the two so we can color code what is on the schedule and what is behind. So now the owner, the designer, and the contractor will all be on the same page in terms of how much work is being done. So it's really computer vision and AI for construction. Um, and that's all about reconstruct. Fantastic, thank you. So therein ends that formal part of this panel. And now I hope we're gonna have uh, a lively discussion. So I would encourage anyone who is in the audience, um, you can ask us questions. And if there's specific questions to an individual um, panelist, they can type an answer. Otherwise we'll throw it open to everyone else and maybe have a bit of a discussion. Um, the, the purpose of this uh, uh, the panel is to talk about corporate partnerships. And we have a couple of different models here. And I, Daphne, I'm gonna turn it first over to you because you have this impressive long background and it looks like you've raised like $30 million in non-dilutive uh, financing from strategic partners. Can you talk a little bit about what that all was and any kind of words of wisdom or takeaways that you have from more than one experience from the look of it? Yeah, to be clear, that was not Aspiring Universe. <laughs> the company's too new. Um, Just yeah. talk a little bit about your experience, because I think you've had a lot of it and you've done it again several times. So, Right, right. Well, I, um, I started my own company several years ago, uh, spun it out of the University of Chicago, and uh, that was also in the agriculture space. And through that, we had some unique technology. It was a biotechnology package. Um, initially licensed to four of the large multinational ag companies. Those were structured as um, multi-year R&D projects that gave uh, basic structure was technology access fees, uh, R&D support, milestone payments, and ultimately royalties. So they were, they were fairly normal, but um, getting those large companies to sign up for something that is significant is, is not easy. So the deal cycle does take some time. Um, it helps if they all feel they're competing with each other and they might be left out. So that uh, worked quite well for us. In addition, I've worked in other areas, uh, worked as a partner with a software company that we recently exited. That company also made some very strong alliances that helped its uh, funnel. You know, we were able to uh, profile our product with uh, alliance partners and uh, provide a tremendous amount of influx of capital to the company in that way. Um, other situations, you know, collaborations, advising various companies, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a process. I think one of the key tips I would have for people is the more you can put yourself in the shoes of your partner, understand what their day-to-day -day life is, understand the drivers of the managers you're talking to. Um, I think a lot of times small companies come in and tell somebody they're doing it all wrong and we're going to tell you how to do it better. And that's not very conducive to getting a deal done. So I, you know, approach it collaboratively and, um, you know, just try to create a win-win for both sides. I saw a lot of smiles, a lot of head nodding. So I'm leaving it open to others to jump in, please. Yeah, happy to add on to that. I think uh, I think that's the last point was really on the nose. Uh, basically, and, and I think uh, it depends a lot on the corporate uh, side too. Some of them, so we, we worked with large corporates since 2017 and everybody has a slightly different process, slightly different attitude. Uh, some of them, most of the people that we work with have had like a, you know, uh, technology scouting, innovation, uh, technology acquisition type group. Uh, but even there, you know, it varies from group to group, right? So it really depends on the people that you're working with. And it really depends on the company culture as well, whether they're looking to collaborate and kind of co-create a solution that's exactly right for them or, you know, all the way, which, you know, we've had the luck of having several of those groups uh, being interested in having worked with us. Uh, and on the other hand, we've had, we've worked with people that are like, yeah, we're not gonna really tell you what we need, but, you know, you 
we just need a finished product ready to go. It's like, okay, then we'll talk at some later point, I guess. Uh, but, um, you know, it definitely helps to build personal relationships uh, and try to understand the corporate uh, partners' needs in a really high level of depth and detail uh, before just saying, hey, this is what we have um, and, you know, buy it, right? And where we started from was really uh, from a pre prototype uh, stage where we caught a few people's eye and they're like, yeah, there could be something there. And uh, those are the interactions that we've appreciated the most where people are willing to give us feedback on like, okay, this is, you know, where the bottlenecks are in our business. And, you know, this is what you would need to do from uh, like a, you know, product design, product uh, performance perspective uh, for it to be really useful to us. So getting to those conversations um, is, uh, is the game changer. Ani, I saw you taking notes, so I know you have something on your mind. Jump in, please. Well, I think uh, Sam uh, unmuted himself, so I'll let Sam go first <laughs> with the same word. <laughs> okay. Sam, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I was going to say initially when we started the company, we did not, you know, fully grasp the dynamics inside these big corporations. So we we're talking to a Fortune 500 company and, you know, a startup has a lot less hierarchy I and mean, we did not realize that. So like uh, the, the person that was really heading and uh, leading the, uh, the contract was um, the director and uh, apparently you have different approval levels for each uh, for each type size of uh, contract and uh, he really wanted to keep it below the approve his approval level uh, and uh, you know we ended up reducing the size of the contract and then pushed it through and then we could later get a get another uh, you know bigger contract with that uh, back, uh, that uh, successful contract that we initially uh, did and he could sell it better to the, uh, the to the VP level at, at the company. So I think understanding the dynamics in these big corporations is very important and uh, uh, that that really helps uh, find uh, what type of um, what type of contract to propose or what type of project to start so we can better align everyone's uh, interest and uh, push it through. Yeah, I would just add to that just a little bit. I think from working internally and also as an entrepreneur, I would reinforce, understand the process each of them runs, right? Who is the decision maker? What is their budget? Is it this year in the budget? Is it next year in the budget? You know, who are all the stakeholders, which can be very hard to identify. And that's, if you can get an internal advocate who kind of opens up and tells you who's who, you know, those are really valuable resources. So, Ani, back to you, really. <laughs> this time you... <laughs> Um, you know, um, we've been fortunate that, you know, before we had a company, we had corporate partners. Uh, we had the opportunity of piloting our technology with the largest construction management company in the U.S. and we received innovation awards from them. We ended up presenting our solution at World Economic Forum and we were recognized for that and that immediately brought attention to us. It was good and bad. Um, the good part of it was the fact that, you know, we knew that there's a path forward for commercializing the solution. But a bad element of that is, you know, we had partners before we had a solution that we can offer them from day zero. So we had to do fundraising. And of, of course, we had to figure out how we can start scaling up our operations. So on that front, over the years of uh, Reconstruct, we've done all kinds of corporate partnerships. Of course, um, you know, the community in Champaign Enterprise Works really helped us connect with the investment community in the early days. And through that, we're able to bring uh, the financial resources, the business resources that we need to scale up. Um, so we had the opportunity of, uh, you know, being uh, led on a financing round by Sarah Ventures, Illinois Ventures, and quite a few other uh, groups in the area. And um, that led us to explore other types of partnerships. So we explored partnership with technology companies that are well known in our industry, because we wanted to bring brand and recognition of them into, you know, small company reconstruct that is now, you know, trying to uh, scale up their operation. On that front, we competed with close to about 380 companies at Oracle um, startup competition. And Oracle is the largest um, company when it comes to construction project control solutions. Um, so we were, had the opportunity of being selected. So we were the first company to go to that accelerator program. And that meant for us marketing support, business development support, and more than anything, sales support. 
we really unlocked that entire system of Oracle that is very well connected with every single 100 ENR construction company in the US to tap into that. Then over the years, you know, as we try to really figure out who has the authority to purchase a solution from, uh, from us, you know, we realized, of course, we're working for the contractors, but contractors get paid by the owners. So what if we try to figure out a strategy that we can add owners as partners? Because now we can team up with our own uh, clients, the contractors, so we can together go after owners and start selling our solutions to them. That, is, that strategy has actually worked really, really well for us. We have clients, including Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. We have clients that are running convention centers in Florida. So projects that are larger than a billion dollar. Through that connection, you know, we got hooked up with insurance companies, all kinds of sales channels. So right now, we have actually a really large set of corporate partners from end users to um, clients of our end users to technology providers, sales partners, and investment community. Um, Those are some really interesting points. I'm going to highlight a couple and then look around, see who jumps in. One, obviously, is the ecosystem development and how you can use large corporations to help do that. And sometimes it polarizes in the opposite direction. So that's an idea we can, we can kind of go into as well. And then the second is that uh, Oracle uh, competition and support. Uh, Chinmay, I know you've done a lot also with a bunch of different um, you know, seed stage collaborations, uh, you know, Farm Beats Hub, you know, the Wells Fargo incubators. I mean, there's are these structured environments at different stages from large companies. Um, that's another theme we can explore. So please jump in. Uh, so I don't know that I have a lot to say about that. Uh, some of these uh, ended up being more badge collection exercises rather than like actual business development benefits. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's partly on us. Uh, the way our business is currently focused, you know, we have like six companies in the world that uh, will benefit from our current product. And most of them have, you know, had inbound interest to us uh, since we began, basically. Uh, so it's kind of a matter of, you know, which, what kind of risk appetite and innovation appetite each of them has uh, as to when they onboard. Uh, so we haven't, at this stage, uh, had to work through uh, other potential ecosystem partners. Uh, it's been mostly one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but yeah, we've, we've had ongoing conversations with sort of the Microsoft Farm Beats Hub definitely is one of the, you know, potential big uh, collaborations. Other kinds of folks like Accenture and Ernst & Young and all, all those kinds of people uh, have also been kind of, you know, there have been some simmering conversations basically when we get to the next stage and approach the next set of sort of next big market segment where it's still B2B, but, um, it, the sort of universe of customers is much larger uh, and it's much more fragmented. The, at that point, I think it makes much more sense uh, for us to work with an existing channel partner, aggregator, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we're not quite there yet, but we're kind of keeping those relationships warm. Daphne, I sounds like you've worked with some of both of these as well. So you're smiling. So yeah, well, I, I was. It's a slightly different thing than you asked, but just one other way of kind of networking in um, that I found to be most helpful is uh, there are quite a few people who have retired from large companies who spent their entire career in those companies, um, and they're not so senior that they're tired of working. They still wanna be connected. They love small innovative companies. They, they really wanna be involved with things. And I think a lot of times the, the small companies think about hiring a full-time staff member. I've found it a lot better to engage um, these senior people who can pick up the phone, call their friend, who's very highly placed at a large company and uh, get you in the door. And you can engage them through board memberships, advisory roles, consulting fees, commissions. You know, there's a lot of ways they'll, they'll give you five hours a week. And so I, I think a lot of times um, the small businesses think more about building their own internal team completely with full-time 
folks. And this to me has been just a much better way to go. Um, high level executive experience without the price, basically. So it's, it's very helpful. I would actually add on and, and reinforce that. I think that uh, what we do in, in terms of the accelerator is we throw 80 to 100 mentors at our startups in the first three weeks. And many of them are like Daphne, you know, has just talked about. These are individuals who want to just give back, give first, uh, give, think about the entrepreneur first. They're excited about being involved with startup. Um, they have the time, they have the energy, and, and they can be tremendous mentors um, throughout the life of the entire company. And again, many, many different ways to engage them and compensate them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's an area where people should, should definitely think about it. The other area is that there are firms that have what they call CXOs. So if you're not quite ready to hire someone for budget, other reasons, you can go to some of these organizations and you can find somebody who's the chief marketing officer or chief, you know, information officer. Um, it's, it's not um, a permanent hire and you're never going to permanently hire that individual, but it might get you over a hump to put in place the infrastructure to then be able to sort of build a little bit um, to level where you are at the, at, the, at the right time in the company. So there's a number of really interesting ways to pursue that. So. Yeah, and I want to add something to uh, what uh, Daphne just said that uh, you know maybe, maybe the opposite side of uh, of it. So when we were when I was at the university, I met a lot of people who obviously they ended up going to a lot of these big corporations, and we really leveraged those uh, connections too. So they, I mean, they were not uh, very highly positioned in the company, but uh, a lot of the contracts we got it started from the lower uh, levels. And so the smaller groups, smaller contracts, and then we started moving up the, the value chain. So that's something I really, uh, uh, I, we really took advantage of and was uh, very helpful. I think those ties to universities and other organizations can be incredibly valuable, really valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, sometimes, um, this is really a function of how the team is set up and what kind of industry we're operating. You know, for us, construction is a pretty low margin of profit industry. So it was always really important for us to figure out how we can understand who has the budget, who has the authority, who has the need, and what is the timeline for us to really get the start on the sales side. Now, with our team being, you know, completely on the technical side, of course, none of us had the experience of, uh, you know, growing the company from, you know, just a few projects that we're working on to hundreds of projects. That required, you know, this art and science in how you do business development and how you actually sell a solution to uh, partners. So we actually, you know, decided to establish some of these partnerships because we were lacking in some of these areas. For example, I touched on Oracle. You know, Oracle is a great company that already has a lot of established solutions. Well, what they're lacking is innovation. On the opposite side, you know, if you're a small company that has a very innovative solution, but doesn't have the recognition or the army of business developers and salespeople that Oracle has. So it was, you know, a natural type of partnership. If you can identify, you know, what is the opportunity of this partnership and what does it mean to you and what does it mean to your partner, then this will be really healthy. Of course, you know, we could have also pursued the idea of bringing somebody on our board, but for us, we try to really understand what is the pain point for our partners <laughs> and try to use that as a strategy to our benefit so we can have a mutual growth uh, on both sides. That worked for us. You know, when we started that with Oracle, we scaled that to Autodesk. Autodesk is another big player. And they were also lacking a uh, solution in that space. You may be surprised. There are solutions at Autodesk that do offer capabilities close to what we do at Reconstruct. Well, you know, we came up with a strategy to work with them. This is really not anymore a competition. We work with their sales team directly on calls to explore opportunities together. Again, trying to tap into areas that they're, you know, uh, in need for help. And what are the areas that we can benefit from the type of experience that they have? And again, the other aspect that was really important for us is to really understand who's willing to pay, going back to that low margin of profit um, notion that I presented. I'm guessing for Chime and Daphne might be the same. I'm guessing agriculture might be closer to construction from that perspective. So for us, you know, we realized, well, maybe we need to do partnerships with our own end users because they sell their own services to another entity, the owners. So if you can package it together, that now the end user doesn't see this as one of the line items of 
you know, general conditions into the contract of the contractor, not be on top of a completely different budget that the owner has to pay for the software. I mean, our software would be a small fraction of a total construction cost. Pick a project on campus. We are doing instructional campus facility, right? Roughly around $50 million. So, you know, when you start looking to that in contrast with the cost of construction um, software, software would be pretty small, but that small number in contrast to the margin of profit for contractor, that will be problematic. So we try to unlock the opportunity of going after the owner. That required us to have other types of partnerships. Can we go after owners? Can we figure out a way that we can help them create the standards that they would make their contractors use a solution like ours? We actually did that. Just to give you guys an example of a corporate partnership, we brought Japanese Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport, which is almost the same as Federal Highway Administration in the US, to Champaign. We host them over a few years. So it actually took us quite some time to make sure that these guys really see what is it that we are trying to envision for the future of the industry. And today, after four years, we are the standard solution for inspection of all bridges in the country of Japan. You know, it, some of these efforts do require, you know, time, but if you have a vision set and you're ready to, you know, make sure you take that risk, then that partnership would also be meaningful. So I wanted to share some other examples of, you know, how you may want to think about these partnerships more from a, uh, you know, um, needs that you have complementary skill sets at the same time, really explore what are the pain points of your potential partners. So there's also something in it for them as much as there's something in it for you. See some nods. Anyone want to jump in on that? All right, I will take a, a question from the audience. What role do you think engineers and technical leaders should have in sales and business development process? Really good point. Smile um, there, Chenye. I have to have you take note. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Lots of smiles here. So, who wants to go first? I, I could. I could jump in. Um, Often in the small innovative company, it's the technology that they're buying, you know, so, so it's absolutely critical that they understand the technology, at least at a high level. Um, I think sometimes um, technical leaders try to give a typical scientific um, lecture <laughs> and a business meeting is not that. Um, you don't need to tell everything you've done, just uh, the narrow slice that's going to apply to that particular project or, or deal. Um, people don't really have the patience to hear about all your struggles that you've gone through over the years and developing the technology. It's, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, that background story doesn't really capture them the same way academic audiences do. And, and by the way, um, I, I used to be a professor, so I've seen them both sides of this and uh, it's a very different style. So really important to kind of understand specifically what does the other party need? And then the technical leader is absolutely critical in giving credibility. Um, the people doing the business side of the deal need that other person as well. The, um, the technical leader is often a friendly, you know, if you will, a good cop in the meeting where then the business person can be tough on terms and, you know, really push on pricing and, and have some of those more difficult discussions. So it's, it's essential that they're there and, um, but essential to think about what is the deal we're trying to craft here. Uh, Daphne raised a very interesting point, you know, the contrast between exciting an audience uh, from an academic perspective versus exciting them from a business perspective. We've had our own share of, uh, you know, cases that, you know, the same as what Daphne is referring to. A lot of our team members obviously had academic backgrounds and for many years, we've always been subject to, you know, exciting audience about the future of how they can transform their, you know, industry. Well, when it comes to a business meeting, it's all about what can they do today? right? There must be something in it for them today. And being able to balance uh, that excitement versus what value they can get today was something that we had to learn. For us, it was more of an experience that, you know, uh, we had to grow up through <laughs> uh, with the experience that we had to reconstruct. So that's, that's an element to it. But in terms of, you know, how they can play a role, for us, it's always been that credibility and trust. Um, 
you know, when you're offering a uh, technical solution that is very innovative, uh, you want to bring that background of why and how this fits into somebody's workflow. So they don't have to reinvent everything that they've been working on. This just adds, you know, it solves one small pain point to their process. So we could have, you know, what we do in, in a lot of our meetings is more to act like a sales engineer person to provide that complementary skill sets that at the right moment, when there's a need for providing that small technical input, we get engaged and we try to make sure that the end user, the customer really understands how this fits into the bigger picture of things that they're working on. So that's a piece that you know we see as an opportunity for our engineers and technical people to join uh, sales and uh, business development opportunities. Uh, something I would uh, add briefly to that is uh, um, it's very important for this the, the engineers and technical leaders to um, really listen to the customer. And when you know when you talk to these uh, uh, partners, you know the the purpose of the company is is to help these uh, partners and not to uh, you know develop cool technologies. And that sometimes sometimes is you know lost in the in the in the. Uh, the technology development process. So they should really keep this in mind. Uh, also, um, uh, based on the, the type of company and what uh, what the company is doing, uh, the you know for us, the technical leaders and you know and engineers, they had to be in the meeting with these uh, uh, partners because uh, you know we are uh, talking about the technical aspects of what project and what what to what what we are actually going to do using uh, do, doing you know, what type of R&D project we're doing, doing and someone who's not technical will not be able to, you know, uh, discuss in those details, but, uh, but we do need someone with sales experience to actually close the deal and push it through the, uh, past the, uh, the finish line. Anything else to add, Jimmy? Yeah, no, I don't think I need to add much, but I, I agree, uh, basically, engineers and technical leaders should know why they're developing what they're developing, what they need to develop. Uh, but at the same time, as Daphne mentioned, you know, uh, we need to temper our sort of, you know, geeking out about the technology and really focus more about learning the customer's requirements. So I mean, given where most uh, tech startups are, it's not really about the sales. It's really like sales is not like, hey, buy this. Sales is, I think, more about understanding the customer's requirement and then making sure that you're meeting that as soon as possible, as uh, Mani said. Like, it's not about like, oh, yeah, 10 years down the line, it's going to be a futuristic, amazing world. Now, what is it going to be in the next quarter, right? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I think. Uh, Transitioning from sort of a technology engineering mindset to a business mindset is uh, important for definitely the leadership uh, and then for the sort of rest of the team, depending on the team's experience, you might want to sort of expose them a little bit, but also not perhaps overwhelm them with the sort of business uh, things that are going on so that they can still continue to do good work. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the conversation that we're having is sort of a contrast between engineering, um, technical leadership versus business. But I also want to provide one more contrast, you know, that sort of scientific leadership versus engineering leadership. That's been also an interesting experience for us because a lot of individuals who are part of our initial team, you know, we are always excited with the most difficult problems that we want to solve. Not that problem that the customer needs to be solved today. So we can actually sell that solution to them tomorrow. That's really interesting. You know, I never thought that we're going to be getting engaged in that type of environment where we would have a hard time motivating some of our best people in the company because, you know, the problem that they have to solve now is pretty straightforward and they're no longer interested in doing that. So we had to work on establishing a culture and putting together a team that everyone sees what is their role and what is it that they can be uh, solving for the company, whether it has to do with solving the most challenging R&D component of the company, to the engineering part that really goes into the product, to really testing it out, to customer success, or what it means to get on the call and just solve a problem of you know, using them and passport for a customer, which a lot of our people were shying away from doing that in early days, all the way to obviously you know, everything that we're discussing on stage. So it's really all about making sure that transition from that prototype to a product 
to a solution that has a business value uh, is, is being managed by exciting every individual in the company. Let's talk a little more about that, about growing companies, because obviously your starting founding team was small. All of you are now several years old. You have, except one exception, but, but you've, you've run businesses before Daphne, so I'll so look back on those others. And you've scaled, you've hired people. Sometimes you've brought in expertise at more senior levels. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that is a transition and, it, and there are multiple steps in that transition as well. Um, well, I, I can start. Um, my past company, I grew to 200 people and it was uh, multinational. Um, we had operations on four continents, so it, it was complicated and shipping uh, product to 50 plus countries, um, including a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa. So there were areas where there was incredible challenge in logistics. Um, you know, I, I come from a tech background and you just have to realize that uh, you need to hire people smarter than yourself and more experienced than yourself in these areas. Um, I, I think companies do poorly when the founder or early stage CEO try to know everything about everything. It's just not possible and it takes a team. So I was really lucky to recruit very experienced people who had been in the industry for a long time and you know, knew, knew what they were doing. And then the challenge is getting them to jump and come to your company, right? You have to, you have to get them captivated by a vision. It has to be financially um, right for them, you know, and a lot of people are willing to take some um, incentives in the future in return for not being paid well in the present, you know, so they will do that, but they have to believe in it and they have to feel that they're going to, um, you know, be able to call the shots in the space they know. They don't, they don't want to be micromanaged by someone who, who doesn't understand what they do. Uh, but re really critical to do that. And again, that, that pulled in people who had networks to collaborators, to partners, you know, who could, who could jump in and help with deals. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard though to find the right people. And I would say also that, you know, companies tend to go through um, a, a lot of stages. The initial team Sometimes they have C-level titles, their actual function might be reduced going forward as, as people are hard above them. And then those individuals may not be who you need for the long term, you know, so you, you need to be um, able to recast yourself and evolve, you know, probably every two to three years. And it means that everyone has to more or less requalify for their job and including all the people at the top. You, you just have to be asking yourself, are you are you the right person for the next stage? Other, other topics, I, I think, Sam, you brought it up in your opening comments, the length of time it takes to have a corporate partnership. And I think Daphne, you then talked about how sometimes playing one off the other helps. And then we have the example of four years where you're slowly nurturing a, a relationship Let's talk about how long on average these corporate relationships take and then what happens once you land them in terms of managing them, right? Because those are, those may not be easy either. Yeah, so uh, in, in my experience, um, when, when from the initial contact, initial talking, the meeting uh, with, the, with the company, it, you know, it, it took us well over a year to uh, to get some of those uh, contracts that, that were maybe a little bigger. You have you have legal has to approve it. The different levels in the company have to approve it, depending on the size. And you have to you know come up with a statement of work what what exactly you want to do. So it, it takes a very long time, and you know maybe sometimes too long for for startups. Uh, so that was uh, partly one of our motivations to uh, start working on. Uh, uh, other projects that we can uh, package the whole the whole product and then we can license that to a company and that's been uh, very uh, successful and uh, the you know the investors are you know like like this uh, a lot uh, a lot more but um, just being able to uh, go through this sales cycle with these big companies is very different from you know consumer uh, 
products. I see my other entrepreneur friends who, you know, who are selling products on Amazon and, you know, it's just, I mean, it has its own challenges too, but it's a, a lot faster for sure. And that, uh, uh, that, that has a lot of value. So I think if we are going to, if someone, that company is going to work with these bigger corporations, definitely plan, plan ahead. Cause it's not going to be, you know, the deal is not going to be closed in a month. Uh, plan at least a year, uh, hopefully sooner. But uh, this is this has been our experience, at least for the type of project we work with. Yeah, for us, it's really a cost of acquisition. Uh, we can't afford to spend all of our resources, such a small company we used to be, and we are even today, um, into every type of partnership. So we always try to assess how long we can spend on exploring that as an option. And what is the cost to acquire that type of partnership? And what it means for us even in long term? We keep reassessing. For example, sometimes we partner, we get a few projects. Well, you know, our goal was really to land on thousands of projects that that partner does. And even then, you know, we make another reassessment of, is it really the right type of partnership for us? Should we, you know, channel our resources to a different direction? So that assessment is something that's continuous for us. We keep doing that and make sure we don't, we know that we don't have to spend all of our resources on partnerships that are risky for us. I, um, if I could just add to Manny's comment, I, you know, the, the risk of the partnership is something we haven't really talked about. We, we've been talking about the opportunity and how wonderful it is to, to do this, but um, I have seen a number of ag tech companies get one deal with a large corporate partner who wrap their arms around the intellectual property so tightly that it was impossible to do anything with anyone else. And um, I also have a friend who's been in the industry about 30 years and her comment to me, she was in a large company, was in all of those 30 years, every time the small company has asked for their, their price, it was always lower than they were prepared to pay. <laughs> They've never had a situation where the small company asks for too much. Um, so I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, there's, there's danger there and uh, you, you need to be, you know, we all need to be careful that we don't um, wet back ourselves into a corner or part with the technology too cheaply. So you're, you're kind of balancing the survival of the business. It needs capital. It needs, it needs to grow, but also should try to do the best deal possible. And, and you're really outgunned and, you know, <laughs> in, in a big way with these big companies uh, working with the small companies. They have an army of lawyers and other people to throw at it. I, I think that's a great comment and it's a good one to end on. I would just add that do your homework before you jump into bed with any of these companies, talk to as many people as you can and find their reputation and all those things. because. You know, generally you can find those out if you talk, ask a lot around. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, we have now up on our time. So what I wanted to do is thank all the speakers for joining and their wonderful comments and insights and say thank you in general. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. And thanks to Lila for facilitating this discussion today. We put a link to the Stanley Techstars Accelerator. And as she said, she helps work on corporate partnerships and in particular, an IIoT and manufacturing and AI types of projects. Do you wanna say just a bit about that, Lila, of what types of technology interests you have? Absolutely. So Stanley Black & Decker is very interested in driving technology into the manufacturing floor, but that really reaches all back into product design and back into supply chain all the way to the customers. And we're really looking at AI. So you're looking at absolutely IoT because you have to take the data from the factory floor to be able to do anything with it for machine learning or AI but you also need to be able to understand those workflows that connect the different parts of the businesses. So I look at all those. I look at entrepreneurs who are building hardware. So robots are great fun to look at and we work very closely with them all the way to software. And uh, thank you for letting me do my two minutes of description. I look forward and hope that we can attract some entrepreneurs from your community. Um, please reach out to me. I'm happy always to talk to anyone and give my thoughts. Um, and I'm probably gonna be setting up some office hours where you can just grab 15 minutes of my time and just ask any question you want because I'm always happy to help entrepreneurs. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Lila. Have a great afternoon.